Even with hundreds of hours into Genshin Impact, there are still a ton of things players are discovering. Hello friends, it's Livid here, one half of the team behind Legacy Gaming, and today I'm sharing 17 massive tips that can change the way you progress in the world of Genshin Impact. If you haven't checked out our Wish I Knew Sooner video prior to this, there are a ton of tips and tricks that will help any player have a better experience. This time, however, we'll be going even deeper into the game's systems that'll help you explore faster, save resources, and clear enemies more effectively. Now, if this game had any sort of competitive scene, be it PvP or leaderboards, this first tip would be absolutely game-breaking. Fortunately for us, it isn't. Believe it or not, your character's height in the game actually makes a difference in a huge way when it comes to exploration and not just in regards to running speed. Take this body of water, for instance. If you look at both Chi Chi and Jean side by side, Jean can just walk right through this body of water. Chi Chi, on the other hand, she's left swimming. Over time, something like this can add up to hours upon hours of slowed progression. So if you have the opportunity, try and use your tallest character for exploration. If you thought height was the only thing that could affect the way you explore more efficiently, this one is even bigger and even affects other systems in the game as well. All characters in the game have unique bonus traits that can help you cook, craft, complete expeditions, and even explore more efficiently. Take for instance Mona. When you enter the alchemy table to refine ascension materials, make sure you slot her as the crafter, and you will have a 25% chance to refund a portion of the crafting materials, saving you potentially a ton of resources over time. Not only does Mona provide that bonus, but her basic sprint also allows you to sprint across water, completely negating the need to swim. There are other characters that also excel at improving your party's mobility overall, and are good to include in an exploration party or for just resource farming. Razor and Kaya both reduce your entire party's stamina consumption for sprinting by a massive 20%, letting you run much longer before having to rest. The same applies to characters like Amber and Venti, who both reduce your party's stamina consumption when gliding by 20%. These little bonuses on each character are huge over time and can save you hours in game. With these traversal tips in mind, you're going to be eating up all the resources on the map in no time. But it's important to note that every resource in the game has a respawn timer. Some, such as Crystal Ore, can take upwards of 72 hours to fully respawn. Do yourself a favor, and even if you are using the awesome Genshin Impact interactive map, Mark these main farming locations on your map. You can even use this feature to put a second mark right next to it to tell you when you started your timer for it to respawn, so you aren't wasting time coming back to it the following day with nothing to harvest. Some of these resources are needed in the hundreds for late game progression, so you need to start collecting these as soon as possible. I regret passing up so many dandelions early on now that I'm in need of them for progressing gene late game. It's also important to note that the weapons you use to farm specific items matters in terms of speed. Weapons other than claymores take a long time to break resource nodes. If you don't have a claymore using character when farming, consider using your downward slam attack. Even with sword wielders, usually two to three slams will break any ore node in addition to damaging any other nodes within the vicinity. In the same vein as resource farming, did you know there are minor bosses all over the map that are also on respawn timers and are critically important toward late game progression due to their drop materials? Inside of your adventurer's handbook, you'll see a section labeled bosses. At first glance, you may not pay attention to this because, hey, you already know where all the elite bosses are on the map. But this tab doesn't just show those larger enemies. It also shows these enemies who up till now, you may have thought were just random encounters. Each one of these minor elite enemies have a certain number of them that spawn within the world each day, and all of them have specific material components they can drop without the need to spend resin. You will need dozens, sometimes close to hundreds of these materials to upgrade your characters late game, so every day you should be depleting these boss spawns and stocking up on these resources for when you need them later on. Or that resin wall that everyone is complaining about right now will hit you twofold when you are so low on these materials as well. While we all agree the resin system needs work, for everyone who just thinks the only thing left to do at the end of each day is to wait for resin timers, this should easily add another one to two hours of activities for you to complete daily. Now, what if I told you that co-op in this game is actually insanely useful for progression? You'd probably say I'm crazy, right? But just hear me out. While we're on the topic of resources and boss farming, 
Co-op is extremely useful because you can take advantage of these very same resource farms and bosses in your friends and even strangers' worlds. If you and a friend load up into your world and exhaust all your main resource deposits, minor elites, and even elite boss locations, simply rotate over to their world, and as long as they're farming on the same schedule as you, all these resources and bosses will be available to farm yet again. The caveat here is that only resources that are node-based, such as ores and enemies who drop items on death, are shared in a co-op world. All other resources, like flowers for instance, can only be picked up by one player in the party. So just make sure you are clear in which resources you do and don't want your co-op partners picking up. While the co-op system isn't rich with new activities, it is an insanely useful one that should be taken advantage of. Speaking of resource farming, wouldn't it be great if there was something that could at least cut down on some of the time spent on the more critical farms in the game? Here is where sigils come into play. If you weren't already aware of their existence, now is the time to embrace them. During your playtime, you will earn special sigils in all the regions of the game for use at special shops with a gem icon that contains a limited amount of ascension materials, weapon crafting parts, constellation upgrades for your main character, and even large amounts of mora, the later of which can be purchased so long as you continuously have more sigils. In Mondstadt, Anima sigils can be obtained through upgrading your Statue of the Seven as well as opening various chests throughout the region. In Leeway, you can also earn Geo sigils via upgrading your Statue of the Seven and opening chests, but you also come across small rocky outcrops on cliff sides that contain sigils you can collect. Spend these. Everything can be bought in the shops eventually, and everything is a limited amount besides the Mora. If you are efficient at spending these Ascension materials and only focus on two, maybe three characters, these will go a long way to cutting down on the resin wall we are all hitting. We expect other regions in the game to feature these same sigil systems as more are added to the game, so be on the lookout for them. With all these resources and upgrades you'll be stocking up on, chances are your limiting factors to progressing will also include Mora. Did you know that you can actually sell your trash tier artifacts by heading to the bottom left of your artifact menu, selecting trash, and selecting which artifacts you want to get rid of? It's a great way to get Mora if you have a surplus of items. Now you can also do the same with weapons, but instead they provide enhancement crystals. Just some neat ways to save some space and keep progressing. While on the topic of artifacts and weapons, I think it's important to note that when you are leveling these items up, it's actually possible to roll two times or even five times multipliers when enhancing these. This will result in no extra Mora cost and will actually significantly boost your items level compared to the normal amount. When this procs, you will often save a ton of Mora and even enchantment items from these random occurrences. You can even try and game the system by actually only leveling your items one level at a time to try and make every attempt grant you that rare bonus. Since regardless if you level your item by one level at a time or five, it will still cost you the same amount of Mora. So spend the extra time to potentially save some time. Now, I'm not sure how many players are aware of this, but by completing daily commissions, you will earn progress towards unlocking special keys found here inside your quest log and are capped at three stored at a time. These can be used to unlock special story quests, which I assume will have even more available as the game's development continues. The current ones available as of making this video can be claimed at levels 32, 34, and 36, with that first one allowing us to actually play as Klee before she's even available in game. These also award a decent amount of adventurer's XP, so if you're a high enough level and haven't done these yet, go do so. I'm sure most players watching this at some point have come across a tier list of characters, and the biggest thing I have to say about these are to honestly ignore them. Except for Amber. Amber's not great. Now, the reason I say this is because of two things. The first being constellations. One of the great things in my opinion about the game when it comes to opening banners in Genshin Impact is that even when you get duplicates, they have a use in the form of providing constellation upgrades. These are additional stats, skill upgrades, and sometimes change the way you build a character entirely. A character that has maxed out constellations versus one that has none is a night and day difference. Constellations provide massive boost to your characters and can even result in changes so drastic that a character that one might consider B tier could become S tier under the right circumstances. Also, don't forget that depending on your team composition, even a character considered low tier might actually have a solid place on your team. Play who you are most comfortable with, but just don't forget to apply these constellations. The other huge change that affects a character's effectiveness on your team is locked behind level 70. Once your character reaches 70, they unlock their final talent, 
which are almost always amazing upgrades. They can even turn an already amazing character into an ungodly one. This is why in most cases, between the constellation upgrades and reaching level 70, it is very hard to accurately judge just how good a character is for your particular team composition and situation. While on the topic of talents, are you making sure to level these up? Once a character reaches Ascension Phase 2, talents open up to be progressible as well. Every time your character ascends afterwards, your talents can be further increased. These talent upgrades can improve their base stats on either their auto attacks or your abilities themselves. These unfortunately do get really expensive over time and can take weeks to complete if you aren't preparing ahead of time by stocking up on the appropriate talent books from specific domains. The big takeaway here, however, is don't upgrade all of a character's talents if you aren't going to take advantage of those things on that character. For instance, if you're using someone like Jianling solely for support and not her basic attack damage, level up her Guoba and Pyronado since you are purely popping these abilities and swapping off of her. Don't get hard locked when progressing by wasting these books on talents you won't be taking advantage of. Another thing that most players might find obvious but don't actually use that often to increase their stats temporarily are food buffs. With all these resources that you're picking up, you might as well put these to use frequently. Don't sleep on these food buffs. Some of these are absolutely insane and can make an otherwise challenging encounter an absolute breeze. There are even some quests in the game that can award legendary food recipes that have insanely high stat buffs. Just know that these meals are expensive to craft, but taking advantage of special character passives that I mentioned earlier on can give you a chance at crafting extra portions made when perfectly cooking these. Just be aware, every character has a fullness meter, something I didn't actually realize till a decent way through progressing. Once they are full, they can't be fed for a good amount of time. This means even things like revive foods and HP foods will become unavailable to your team during that time. Plan ahead and make the best use out of these cooked meals. Don't just let resources and the meals sit idle in your inventory. Here is the time when I finally get into some combat tips. The biggest and most obvious being don't sit on an enemy with basic auto attacks or abilities of the same type in an attempt to take down their shields if they aren't the right tools for the job. Each elemental shield has a specific element that'll take it down faster than everything else you could throw at it. Matching that weakness will burst down that shield, saving you time and valuable combat resources before this enemy manages to wear your team down. Another huge combat tip is in regard to invulnerability frames, or iframes as most people refer to them. Certain ultimates in the game have special iframes that can completely ignore damage while they are being cast. Using these during tough fights, especially at higher spiral abyss levels, where even the littlest amount of damage needs to be avoided, is key to mastering your team's abilities and rotations. Take some time to practice these timings, and it will become second nature. Now, what if I told you that you could swap and cast your ultimate even faster? If you hold down your alt key and swap to a character with an ultimate ready to be cast, it will swap into immediately casting it, meaning those iframes we are looking for can be triggered at split seconds notice. It also allows you to make sure you are combining elemental reactions as quickly as possible to get out the most amount of DPS as possible on your targets. The very last tip I will leave you with is not to sleep on the Spiral Abyss and its rewards. Now, I know this is a major endgame location and most players are not even here yet, and that's fine. Just know that inside the Spiral Abyss, achieving three stars in a chamber will award you a ton of Mora and Primo Gems the first time you clear it at three stars which ends up being around 300 Primo Gems per full floor completion. That's 2400 Primo Gems just by completing floors 1 through 8 perfectly. Now I know this is something that isn't easy, but give it some time and you'll be clearing those for those awesome rewards in no time. Also important to note is that the further down you get into the Abyss, you will also start earning character XP material, 4 star artifacts, and even some 5 star artifacts as rewards. The real kicker and main endgame allure, however, lies within floors 9 and above. These aren't one-time completions like floors 1 through 8, and while they are one hell of a challenge to complete, these rewards reset and allow you a great source of Primo Gems, Mora, and tier 4 and 5 artifacts. So if you're looking for a solid endgame challenge, it's there, but it will take some time to reach. And there you have it friends, a ton of advanced tips that should make your journey through Genshin Impact more enjoyable and time efficient. If you have a tip and you'd like to share, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. If you found this video useful, consider smashing that like button and subscribing to Legacy Gaming. While you're at it, remember, you can always join us on Discord. Our community is spread across dozens of great games, so click the link below and join us today. 
My name is Livid, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.